And if the only prayer you ever say is thank you, that will be enough. Eckhart Tolle said this, but I believe he stole it from a 13th century monk named Meister Eckhart, who actually got into a little trouble for the, with his church for this saying, um, as it didn't include God intrinsically. But the church reinstated him, which I was glad to see. And the, the thought of the prayer is wonderful. And if you are re religious, you are saying thank you to your God, to your God as you know them to be. And if you are not in a monotheistic religion, you say thank you to your life. You say thank you to the life energy out in the universe. Now, gratitude is one of the most important things that you can do to change the lens through which you view the world. And if you change that lens, everything that you look at is going to be different. Emerson said it this way, to different minds, the same world is a hell and a heaven. Two people looking at exactly the same situation can see it totally differently. There's a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and in that book, Viktor Frankl says that he noticed, oh, Viktor Frankl was in Auschwitz and in Dachau. He noticed that when prisoners gave up, when they gave away their last scrap of food for a cigarette, when they had no hope for the outside world, that they died more quickly than those who had a vision and a purpose for what they were going to do. And his vision and purpose was to go out and talk about the horrors of the Holocaust, which he did do. And he went out. He also envisioned his wife sitting as a bird who would fly by. And he had all sorts of incredible visions that kept him alive through the most horrific times. And his view of that horror was, I am going to take this and I am going to learn from it. If you have that attitude, you are free. And Viktor Frankl talked about that. Your last freedom is your thoughts. It also reminded me of a story of when I first noticed this. And I was younger. I was pregnant. It was Easter Sunday. I was so happy. I didn't have any children. I had had four miscarriages before this. I was sure that this pregnancy was going to be the one that was going to take. I was in my in-law's backyard. And when, when God, as I know him, she or they to be, when God granted me in-laws, I hit the jackpot. My in-laws were the most beautiful people on the planet Earth. And I was there with them. My mother-in-law was a fabulous cook. My beautiful husband was there. My nieces and nephews were looking for Easter eggs. They were swinging on an A-frame swing. And I was so happy. And I think even that morning, I had taken my flute and I had played an Easter Sunday service Nothing makes me happier than playing an Easter Sunday service. And then the next day, I miscarried. And I was just, I was crestfallen. This was my fifth miscarriage. I was getting older. And then it struck me that I was exactly the same person that day as I was the day before. All of the love that was in my life was exactly the same. The core of my being was exactly the same. All of my strengths, all of my loves, all of my gifts were exactly the same, except for one, that everything else was still there. And I got it. I got that I did not need to color my entire world by this lens that I had been in of infertility and of want and of need and of depression, and that I could move on. I got that I was like a little lever. There was just like a little lever. And right here on the top was happiness, and here was complete devastation. And the difference between it was just this tiny little inch. And that wasn't reality. In reality, I was deeply blessed. So that struggle, which struggles can often do, certainly made me stronger and started me on this journey of learning about positivity and learning about the lens with which people look at their lives. 
there's a, a man who's done some wonderful studies in gratitude, Robert Emmons, and this is one of his book, Gratitude Works. He has another one, I think, called Thanks. He took three different sets of students. He had one set of students write down five things they were grateful for each night. He had the second set of students write nothing. And the third set of students wrote five things that did not work out well for them during that day. At the end of 10 weeks, he measured their happiness levels, which he had done at the beginning also. And the people who wrote down five gratitudes a day were 25% happier, 25% happier. That is a lot happier by just writing down five simple things that you're grateful for. I had a personal story about this is I had a colleague who was extraordinarily unhappy. He complained bitterly about everything. He complained about the students. He complained about the administrators in my school. Nobody would want to sit next to him in the teacher's lunchroom. And he was really, really struggling. Without tenure, he would not have kept his job, I don't think. I saw him after about a year and a half. And I sat next to him. And I looked over and I almost didn't recognize this very calm, collected man. So I looked at him and I go, oh my goodness, what, what have you been doing? Exercising, meditation? And he says, I have a gratitude journal. I write five gratitudes every night. Oh my gosh, I can tell you, this man was transformed. So this is my totally, once again, unscientific study of one, but I can tell you I have seen it happen. And in my life, I have seen it work too where I will end my day. I don't write them down myself, but I end my day with one thing that I'm grateful for, like an evening prayer. And that's one thing that evening prayers, God bless mom, God bless dad, when a little kid is saying their evening prayers, they are doing gratitude. One thing the gratitude people want you to do is to take, relive your gratitude, savor every moment of what you're grateful for. I right now am recording this in my extremely beautiful cabin in Vermont. I actually tried to record it so you could see the lake behind me, but it just didn't work. So you got to trust me. In that direction, right over there is this beautiful lake. Um, and sometimes I'm just grateful for this lake. This lake actually grounds me. It is one of my holy places. Now, there are a couple different types of gratitude. We can be, grat we can be grateful for, you know, winning the lottery. We can be grateful for uh, somebody did a kind thing to us. Or we can simply be grateful for everything. Apparently Maslow said that it is essential in our growth as human beings that we become grateful for everything, that we look at everything in our lives and we see a lesson from it and we know that we can learn from it. If you have nothing to be grateful for, you can be grateful for your hands or be grateful for Rodin's hands right here or whoever's hands those might be as sculpted by Rodin. Willie Nelson says that when he started counting his blessings, his whole life turned around. MC Hammer says it's all good, which is a good thing to say. Now, this also reminds me of one of my favorite things that I had up in my classroom. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, except for bears. Bears will kill you. Unfortunately, death, it's really hard to get stronger after death. But up until that point, which is, which is a long way to go, you can really use everything to learn from it. There's a wonderful philosophy teacher named Tom Morris, who was one of the most, um, most popular teachers at Notre Dame. And his philosophy 101 class was taken by more students than any other class in their history. He has a great book called Plato's Lemonade Stand, where he's talking about the Stoic philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, and how they took lemons, how they wanted you, to see when you receive a lemon, you are to simply transform it and make it into something else like lemonade. His quote is, with everything in this world, you can either enjoy it or learn from it. And when you learn from it, you can enjoy it. That's a pretty darn good quote. He also wrote uh, Philosophy for Dummies. So he's quite the ex expert in philosophy. Now I'm gonna go quickly about the oh well tool, which is my personal tool for handling the disappointments of life and keeping yourself a little more positive. I learned this tool, I got inspired by it, by Herbert Benson, who was a cardiologist and 
was responsible for taking meditation and demystifying it and turning it into something that schools could use, that hospitals could use. He researched in the 60s and 70s and found that meditation did amazing things for pain relief, for anxiety, for stress, just for almost anything. If you have a problem and you Google, let me try meditation for blank, 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 insomnia. You will find that there are studies that say meditation helps you. So one of the tools of meditation is, is your, or one of the methods of meditation is that you sit quietly, you focus on either a word, a mantra, I focus on love sometimes, and your breath. Your breath in, your breath out. If thoughts come by, they are not your enemy. You simply notice them, you invite them to leave, and you say, oh well. So Herbert Benson came up with, oh well, as a completely non-judgmental thing to say when your thoughts do come by. And don't worry, your thoughts are not your enemy. So now I'm gonna combine oh well, and I'm gonna put it into um, a little bit into our life. But first, before I do this, this man is S.N. Gwenka. He is a Vipassana meditation teacher, also known to really help popularize meditation. He just died, his obituary was in the Times in April. This is 2020. Um, he says, if your thoughts are drifting, start again, start again. He also says, with patience and diligence, you are bound to be successful, bound to be successful. So I just love both of those things. So I put them together. And if you take anything in your life that happens to you, anything at all, simply say, oh, well, don't judge it. It's not good. It's not bad. And then ask yourself to start again. And if starting again isn't appropriate, ask yourself, what's important now? What do I need to work diligently and patiently on so that I am bound to be successful? So whatever it might be, we say, oh, well, if it's raining on your wedding day, instead of complaining to the rain gods, you simply say, oh, well, and you enjoy the beauty of that magnificent day. This actually also reminds me a lot of the incredibly brilliant um, serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And in AA, they use this prayer and they say for you to take the word God as you understand it to be so that it includes everyone, not, and if God is not in your, um, your particular belief system, just start with the word grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That is the theory of, oh, well, just, oh, well, if I can't change it, I'm going to let it go. Courage to change the things that I can. That courage is gonna come from your good soul, your higher being, your guiding light, whatever that is for you. And the wisdom to know the difference will also come from that good soul and that guiding light that guides you.